Sometimes it is fake news. You have to sort of be walk the righteous path. Anyway, as an introduction, I would argue that um, modern life sciences are increasingly information sciences. In the old days, you could do it with knowledge, thinking hard, working with ideas, maybe sometimes in the absence of all too many observations. And of course, in the old days, observing was a harder thing to do than nowadays. We are better than ever before able to go into cells, measure the smallest things, follow a protein, it goes into the Golgi system. Oops, now it's getting out, it goes into the endoplasmatic reticulum, and now it's going to the cell membrane and you know, going through into the next cell. We are all able to measure these things, not for just one component, but for maybe all the components that are there in the cell. Well, not quite yet, there yet. So that's a very important point. We can measure and observe more than ever before, and that's, that's important. Uh, another thing is that, that um, you know, in the old days there was physics and chemistry and biology, and that we have that for centuries. So those are the pillars, and now you see that a lot of activities are emerging in between those pillars. By the way, those pillars themselves, the physicists nowadays probably don't do exactly the same as what they did two centuries ago, right? The pillars themselves move as well. But in between there's a lot of landscape, and one of those fields, as you know, is bioinformatics. At least we yelled that since the last 30, 40 years, so maybe that's its own pillar. And that's a dangerous situation, of course, because we don't want siloing. We don't want that these pillars uh, work uh, just <coughs> with themselves. And that is uh, increasingly happening, and, and, and thanks to the ability to measure data, we can do so much more. For example, if you work with depression, almost a routine thing that needs doing is that you connect weather reports to the people data, to the human data, because we know that, that you know, climatic circumstances have an influence on, on, on the mind of people. So if you want to really research it, you need all of that stuff. And then you have a big problem, how do you do this? By hand, writing down numbers in a list next to one another, that's what you do. So we have to do uh, many more things and really develop technology for it. So, anyway, so this is about measuring, and you, maybe by now you've seen all of those things. Oh, I know this, I've heard about this, you know. Fundamentals of bioinformatics or introduction to system biology. I know what NMR is. What is NMR? What does that stand for? Very good, so a few of you are. Great, and how is that called in the hospital, by the way? Same technique. So you see the same letters, but of course, the order is different because we're siloing and it's a different field. And of course, you don't want to suggest that technology used in one field is actually the same as in another field. Right? You try and avoid that at all costs. So there you go. That's great. That's, uh, that's. So you see this and, and really, you know, a lot of things. For example, mass spectrometry, you know, being able to very precisely use the weight of molecular components to let them fly further or not as far and measure differences of. But by, by doing that, it's uh, really good. But 
what you see more and more, of course, is all, this is all great and well, all these machines or whatever it is produce data, but then what? You know? So, we need information technology and you guys to really do something with that data. <laughs> now, just one thing from, you know, well, you were born, I think. Well, ah, some of you know, but you know, this is a long time ago, at least as far as you're concerned, right? This was the year 2000, very long time ago. And um, so two papers emerged. One was in the maybe most famous scientific journal, Nature, and the other one, oh, you know, there's a lot of argument about this, of course. In America, they think it's not the case there. They said, no, no, probably science is the most important journal, you know, this planet knows. And you see that citation in the so, you know, it's a competition. And so, but what happened? Who has heard all the ins and outs of the Human Genome Project? Did you? Nobody told you? Okay. I'll, I'll run it quickly past you. Because this was a fascinating story. So basically, this turned out, so in the year 1990, 10 years before, there was a famous press conference in the year 2000. I'm going to um, fill you in on in a moment. Um, there have been people who said, well, let's do something crazy. We know that, you know, solving three or four base pairs of the DNA molecule takes a couple of months with a large team, we know. But let's say there will be a day that we will solve three billion base pairs of the human DNA. And then people said, that's a crazy idea. Okay, you know, you know how much work this is. You need millions of teams. Where are they? You can't do this. It's crazy. Never going to happen. Forget it. Data's nice, but this is absolute nonsense. Bonkers. So anyway, uh, so that happened, and then um, by 95 people said, techniques had a bit sped up by then already, and they said, you know what, now human genomes, the old side. No, but maybe um, baker's yeast, you know, something to make beer, also something very important. Let's try and sequence that. It's a lot smaller, and people still said, that's crazy, can't be done too much anyway, although the genome is a lot smaller than humans, it's way beyond what we can do. And uh, but then, you know, there were guys, and, and in those times there was a guy by the name of, well, his name is not here, but, um, uh, yeah, his name is here, and he's sort of, for, for a moment, the dark Vader in the story, okay? He's the, he's the baddie, he's the baddie for a while. He was a very clever baddie, and that's where you get problems. Being bad is not so, not so bad, but if you're clever at it, then you become the problem. This guy was very clever. He was so clever, and he knew it. In fact, he thought he was much cleverer than he actually maybe was, I mean, you know, it's self-esteem, we have people that are even famous in doing that. This was uh, tremendous. And so he was working in the NIH in America and he said, you know, I'm the cleverest guy in your life. You know what? I am the first guy on this planet who will solve a genome. Baker's genes. I'll do it. I'll do it myself. I'm a genius. <laughs> Give me 20 staff positions, big technical team. I'll pull it up. So with that story he went to the director and he was a very forceful character and the director said, you great, you know, I sympathize very much with, you know, but there are more people working in this lab, you see. What about, crazy number, what about 10 staff positions? You know, we've never given that to anybody before. And Craig got up and, you know, through the roof and bullying and, you know, you know what, I'll leave this place and I warn you now. I'll leave this place, I'll do it for the company. I'll seek with anything there is on this planet, but you pay bitterly. Anything I find I will patent. And then any research you will do in your miserable place, NIH, will cost you. Woo! So that, the guy's crazy, you know. We've seen this before in history, people with grandiose self-esteem. It's not going to work. But then this guy started uh, funding a company, founding a company, and he called it Celera. Celera Genomics, and, uh, you know, in no time he had a lot of money by venture capitalists, so he was able to uh, persuade a few guys. Money is a good thing to be able to do. And, uh, and then he hired the best computer scientists that were known to all these people. And, you know, and what, and what? He bought the biggest computer in the whole of America, a cluster computer that nobody had ever seen. Bloody hell. And before they knew it, he had sequenced a bit of you know, DNA and put it proudly on, online. Maybe he's going to pull it off. My God. So now we have the question like, you know, are you sequencing my DNA, your DNA? And then you say, it's mine, you pay the patent. It's crazy, of course, this is unreal kind of Let's check the law, the legislation. It will be clear that this is crazy. You cannot patent genes for all people. And then there was insanity. Oops, we can let it go to the high court and let it go wrong. What should we do? So then they decided. So we had, uh, by that time, the allies, the, 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 the labs in you know, my case, in England, was the Sanger Center, and you had the Pasteur Institute in France, and they said, let's join. This guy is crazy, perhaps. He's pulling something off him. It's becoming very, very dangerous. So let's, let's be 
finished quicker than this guy. It's one against all. It was a form of that, this dark thing. So here's a little picture. You, you might recognize this president a few times ago, but anyway, he's still known. And you see in the very back there also prime minister of a bit smaller country. That's Tony Blair there. You see the technology at that level. You see this is a television, right? When it still was called television. And uh, see Darth Vader, lower corner. So, his technology, called, he, was, he was so bold and so on because he was a, uh, a Vietnam veteran and technique he developed, he called shotgun technique, you know, so he was in business, this guy. He was doing anyway, this one logo. Uh, so, what happened, and it was a, so this is a threat, I told you, no, a you pay, right, a patent. Because you, you didn't give me all those star positions, now I'm going to do it of my own. And I told you already, it was a shotgun method. But anyway, there was this press conference, 26 June in 2000, when the bitter enemies, the Allies, against this one company, in the end said, look, it was decided a week before the catastrophe. And three weeks before a press conference, with a nice saying by Bill Clinton, was there that I, did, that I decided that the Allies thought we lost. We lost. And was going to win. Then there was a little guy who said, because we can't pull the information together. We have all the snippets. Calculating it, doing the, comp 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 uh, the, the, the computation of getting all these little pieces together, paste it all together, we can't do it. And then there was a small guy in a, in a room up in a loft somewhere in California. I don't know how the lofts are there, but he was kind of working alone all the time. He said, I've got a little program. Let's save the day for the world, for better people. Um, anyway, so you know the stories, I think. This is the, you uh, know, this was the president who was able to say beautiful things. You see, blah, 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 this, uh, Clinton was good at that. Um, most wondrous men ever produced about humankind. Now, I'll show you a few jolly photographs here. So they look all like real friends. Here is the director of the NIH. And this is great vendor here. And you see that, you know, they shake. have this, this small guy is in the middle. But he was specially trained. He was a bodybuilder. You can't see it, but he was able to, you know, to, to keep these two elephants apart. Who were about killing one another. And you see also a handshake, and you know what Trump did at the beginning of his career is no comparison. You know, they were here, you know, they were trying to squeeze each other the hell out of each other. You know. So we're friends now, we're all friends. So, um, oh, this is uh, Eric Lander here. I, I know him, and he told me the story. He was in the, the Broad Institute in Boston, also involved in the project as an ally, the allies. And he said, I got a phone call. I vividly remembered it then, and probably still now. It was nine o'clock in the morning. I, 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 I take the phone, I say hello, that's what Americans tend to do when they pick up the phone. And then the other end, somebody said, hello, good morning, this is Bill Clinton here. The guy says, Mr. Clinton, what can I do for you? Um, I hear there's a form of the secrecy product you are running there. Um, so I hear, you know, you want to speed up, so could you use a bit of money for that? Uh, I suggest you take five million now. So he said, ah, well, yeah, well, you know, I could do something with that. I built two positions, it's your own. So that's what he did. And Clinton handed out a couple of chunks to all kinds of people across the US. So that was maybe the first time the politicians were in on the urgency of a scientific matter, right? I would hope they do this on another small scientific project like climate or something. Well, this, they operate much better here than they do now. So is that amazing? Yeah, we, we can be happy about it, but, you know, in the larger sort of vision about this globe, I'm not too sure. Anyway, so they became friends, and the rest, oh, I didn't so really, the decision to organize this press conference with Tony Blair somewhere is a little video, ha, he's, you know, can't get away with this guy, right, he's always there. So, anyway, um, you know, he was there, and they organized it all, and the world was there, they organized this in two, two, three days. I think on the, this was 26th. I don't, I'm not sure anymore on the 24, 25, they said, okay, let's make this party, we're friends now. The phone calls are frantic and dumb, so it was really sort of, you know, we're friends now, do it quickly. And that's also because the government had invested so much, so they wanted to show that this ended well. So that's what I'm going to say here. All is well, that ends well in the end. And of course, more importantly, we're all totally friends now. So, great friend the dental, oh, okay, I've done this project, now do the next one. Solve all the proteins on the, on the globe and all the genomes, one was not enough. So he started, you know, he was rich by then. He had a boat, he was off the, all the oceans and going faster than anybody else. This guy was about, you know, if there is a problem, you cut it out, and if you want to win, you have to be the fastest. Yeah. 
that was the approach this guy took, and to some success, I have to admit. It's not the most sympathetic of uh, approaches always, but okay. He at least got somewhere. Um, so there was no winner here, and that's a good thing, you know? Because think about this philosophy of you're a winner or a loser, right? I'll run some statistics past you with this idea. If you have a, a, a battle of two people, how many are happy, how many are unhappy? One, one. Very good. Now we do a battle of ten people. How many are happy, how many are unhappy? One happy, nine are unhappy. Hundreds, you see the point. The bigger the battle, the more unhappy people you have. You have always more losers than winners. So is this, you know, is this going to elevate our minds and our happiness? No. It's a nonsensical thing. Anyway. Okay, so a bit about sequencing. Maybe you've seen slides like this. This is not stressing the problem. What are we now? We can measure. So this was, uh, the, uh, this was the, the data, the, the way of measuring they did in those days of the press conference. So the read, the snippet you got out of DNA was roughly 900 to 1,000. And this is logarithmic, so this is 10 times faster, 100 times, 1,000 times faster, you know, we're millions of times faster now than we were then. And, but what you see, and that's interesting, at this side you see things that are not as fast as the fast. So routinely, I should take this because I'm not that tall. So this is the machine we use most of the time still. So you see it's fast, yes, it's up there. But the read length is roughly just over 100. Small snippets we need to build the space together. In the course sequence analysis, you'll learn how to do this, okay? So, bear with me to the next course. Uh, so, this is interesting. I'll show you this machine is interesting. And now we have these ones. So, the read length, and in the end, ultimately, and hopefully by the next generation, we can do it. We have a human genome of 3.3 billion letters of base pairs. We just put it through a port, the whole thing. Well, we have 23 chromosomes, so the problem is not. It's a bit shorter frequency. But anyway, we run that and just use flash photographs. We just photograph a bit. We're close to that sort of technology, right? So, then we don't have to discover some stuff like short snippets that we have, we don't know why they should be in the, in the genome, and we need to paste it all together, and that's a big complex one. Okay, so here, that's the machine, it's getting interesting, the read length is now 10,000, and we're going to 100,000, so we are somewhere. So this is a, you know, this is a big screen, so this is as tall as a person, that's the, the machine we routinely use at the moment. Here, this is the size of what? A memory stick, believe it or not. This is a memory stick, and this is a complete sequencing machine. And to do all of this, you need roughly a suitcase with stuff, with some chemicals and so on to store. But you know, you can go out into African nations, and Ebola is coming up again. I was reading in the newspaper a few days ago. So Ebola patients are not being seen in this department. You can really go into the hotspots and do the work. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. But that stereo image is now you know, more attractive. Anton is uh, worried that I'm not deep enough in my lecture, so he tries to raise the visuals in this sense. Anyway, I hope I've been, you know, I've, I've illustrated enough by now that bioinformatics or all of this biotech and, 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 and life sciences is sort of a nervous field, right? Always there is something, you know, people are fighting. And then, then you think you know a technique and a new technique comes up. You think, you know, you, you have your data set and bloody hell they're measuring new stuff and, and other stuff. You get used to that. All the time, new technology, new form of standards, a lot of hype, of course. My technique is the best, and we prove it in the next paper. And so every now and then, even some new insights emerge, and that's important. Now, if you don't, you know, you're all here, I know, for a few months, but there is still a way out, you know. I'll show you. You know what you should study if you don't want this? Here is just a suggestion, okay? Old ancient Greek philosophy. How's that? Great field, very interesting. How about the data? Every now and then a very old book might somewhere be found in a library, you know, or something carved in stone, literally. So the data's not growing too much, the insights change a bit, but not so dramatically. So, you know, this is a field, you can sit there, read your books, relax, take a coffee, not all this by from them, oh, yeah. measure this, I'll go there, go talk to these people, oh, you know, it's too late, phone call. Anyway, so, that's tough, right? So, to um, argue a bit more on this, so 10 years ago, <coughs> There was the, this is about insight, right? We, we found, we looked for all the sequences, next course, sequence analysis, and they said, look, we have all kinds of conserved elements here. And you know that by now, because you're running class, right? You're not conservationist. And, 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 and they said, okay, that, that's important then. You've learned this, it's important. What's conserved is important normally. And they uh, so has a function, and they couldn't find anything. So what do you do if you want to introduce something new in science? You give it a name, right? The name is very important. 
A good name is even more important. And if you don't understand it, you give it a great name. So what did they call this stuff? They called it hotspots. What was the definition? A hotspot is a conserved area we don't know a thing about. Okay, great. Anyway, so then we were just getting used to it. Okay, we won't find out what it is. It's something hidden there. It has to do with some structure. If you don't know, you fill something in. It is a structural reason, you know. We will measure that later on. We shouldn't worry. And then, you know, we're just used to that. And then uh, people found out, oops, there is not only protein coding genes. We knew that. This, uh, the RNA level stuff is happening. And at once something came up. And they called no, his name as well. They were small, so it was not so strange to call those micro-RNAs, and before you knew it, it was called mi-RNAs, micro-RNAs. And you know, these regions they have called uh, hotspots now turned out in many cases to be the regions where micro-RNA were coded, small surf regions. So, we learned again, and now it turns out that bloody hell, diseases like cancer, it's nice to be able to solve. Micro-RNAs are tremendously important in cancer research. It is a new, whole new layer of, of, in the cell to be able to control things, to do to regulation. Anyway, so a real new layer. As if you've been in a hotel forever, like in America, and no, many countries there is no 13th floor, right? And at once you're on the 13th floor. You don't know why. The elevator stopped. The number is not there, but it's not there. You go in. The doors don't open anymore. You, know, you can't get out anymore. But then you look, you see all these switches on this floor, and it turns out the nervous center of the whole of the hotel is on that floor. You'd never seen it, right? That sort of feeling you have, that people have, oh yeah, you think it's a small new thing, but it has enormous consequences. Understanding the, uh, the system, as you want to understand it, at the systemic level. So that's, that's one thing about knowledge and so on, and then the nervousness goes on, of course, because, you know, I'm, I'm going to argue a lot about data from, from now on. And, you know, people have various names, and tsunami is a bit of, you know, a term that is certainly you not know, politically charged at the moment, you know, as we are into the, uh, the effect of one of large tsunamis. Very dramatic effects, um, but you know, data plethora, the data, whatever it is, you know, lots of data, an avalanche of data. And uh, so, in many fields, not only in biology, you know, really, you know, it's too much, you know. Um, Facebook, they are, have a problem dealing with the data. There is respect, of course, it's getting, you know, they can't get the, the policies right. The mobile industry, more is happening than ever before. Keep the stability is a big, big problem. And I'll show you a few slides uh, on, on, on bio in a moment. So, of course, one of the things, how can you really you know, convert all of this data? Because that's often the question. How do you turn that into understanding? You measure a lot of stuff. But how, how does it help you to formulate in your mind, in your head, what, what is really happening? Okay. And then, what was the old trick? In bio bioinformatics, we used to say, you know, we don't have enough data. You know, 20 years ago, it was an easy thing to say, it was right. Not enough data. Measure more, then we understand it. And now we're at the, in the times where you can't say this anymore. There is too much data anyway, so now we have to come up with another trick. How can we get understanding? So here are a few slides, you might have seen those on data growth. You see this curve, you know, you did your mathematics test, what kind of growth? It's not working very well anymore, the better getting empty. There we are. What curve is this? I can tell you it's not a linear curve. Any other suggestion? How does this grow, you think? I'll show you another one, you know? I'll help you at this. Look at this. Here, this is a logarithmic line here, the scale, and what is this? It grows by definition if the line is straight. I'll tell you, it's exponential growth. Some people call this also logarithmic growth, which is in fact the opposite, but it's the same growth. That's a historic thing. But you see sometimes that here, that even, you know, you see that this curve is rising up, right? So that's growth that is faster than exponential. There's nothing like it. It grows like crazy. Talk about the literature. Same thing. Can we do? How do we deal with this data? It's doubling ever so often, right? So that is why people started saying, and then it was sort of, we were in the Times a couple of years ago, when we got the economists saying, look, you know, what is on this planet? We didn't know it was there before. We have data. And there are even companies that start making money in data. That was a while ago, right? It's now routine. And here it was, you know, welcome to the Yota world. The Yota byte is 10 to the power, I think, 24 bytes. Big number, right? It's a giga, 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 nine, roughly, giga, 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 goodness. 100 giga, giga, I think. Anyway, 10 to 10. Um, so, and the people said data to new oil or even data to new gold, you know, so it was, uh, it was, uh, a lot was happening. So what is one thing, and I, I saw an old, sometimes if you, you're, you don't know what to do, you, you, you can find recourse in 
So it's in religion, and here is one. It was not a religious statement, but it was by a priest, a French priest who used to live in Belgium, and he said once, and there are various statements this, this person made, who you know, I've seen, are still known until today, that you know, genius do, you know, even Archimedes couldn't do what we can do today. He was just as clever as we, maybe even cleverer, he was thinking a lot, but he didn't have the data. And then it becomes difficult, so data is important. And you know, a bit of history for you. Um, 25 years ago, we would say, you know what, I'm going to make a database. They were there already, but people would say, are you crazy? You know, you want to turn yourself into the most boring guy at the planet. Data, type, what? is there anything more boring than that? You know, make a method, make some graphics, show a protein structure, you know, let it move. But you know, data, come on, don't do it. And now you see, it's all data. Two years ago or three years ago in the meantime, they asked, the Dutch population, what do you think are the, 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 the two most important topics? And they said, well, aging, aging society, how to stay healthy when you're older, and the second was data. Amazing. Well, here, you know, 25 years ago, people would have said, you know, this country, you know, let's, let's make it flood apart. You know, this, this guy can't be half anymore. So, you see there, is, there are many, many projects in the I'll tell you about this European Data for the Life Sciences project. We have the, the, uh, the Big Data to Knowledge project in the, in the US. We even had, you know, the White House, not this president, but the last one, um, appointing, you know, the guy is already cool by his name, DJ Petty, right, it's not his job, it's his initials, right, it's fantastic, you know, he came on a skateboard into the White House, fantastic guy, and he was running a project called Precision Medicine, it was all cool, you know, it was of course PMI by then, you know, very cool guy, GDP, you know, running at PMI on the skateboard, this is enormous, so here you go, and you will not see the current president, I think, at least that's my theory with, and this is a real molecule, it was not pasted in, he, he stood next to this molecule's DNA. And it's right turning, you can have it right. DNA should turn like this, right? It goes up and then it turns. So they already asked you this. So, you know, here you go. Politicians and science aligning. That's, that's, that's very good. Okay, um, you know, step back, what, what data? How, how, what are we doing with data? In the old days there were scholars, there were lots of scientists, and they were reading books. You know, remember these things? Heavy. You know, it's instantaneous, like no starting up, no booting. I heard a story of a child of three years old not too long ago. This country, but it could happen anywhere. She got a book in her hand. So, it was given to her open. And then she thought, hey, this is interesting. You can go maybe to something we know is going to the next page. You know, she did it. Didn't work. The page didn't show. Anyway, so you see that we get a generation that, you know, won't know what books are anymore. But maybe that's not bad at all. Old guys like me would say, oh, that's terrible. Now the world is over. Huh? <laughs> no, forget it. You know. Other things will happen. But we have a few questions here. In the old days, you know, books were for elite. This is, you know, a Dutch. I remember that, that in my days when I was young, having a Winkler Prince dictionary was something that happened in families where you'd say, oh, that's respectable. You bought something, and at once you were respectable. Isn't that amazing? And, and, and you know, you would not never open that from who's, who's ever reading in a dictionary. No. In those days, the paper people like this. But, you know, so that meant, but there was a statement, and in many languages you have it, how do you, how do you know what you say? How, how did you find out? And then you would say, and that was enough, I've read it. Ah, you've read it. That was providence. That was showing the value and the truth. I think nowadays that statement has lost a bit of its power, right? I've read it. Where? Well, on this website by this Russian group. <laughs> okay, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, a few questions here. How should we deal with this data? So, we've become tremendously democratic. In the old days, it was for the elite. You had books you could read, so access to information was for privileged. Privileged. And now, access is for everyone. Hardly any person on this planet doesn't have a mobile phone with a connection to Google or something like that, you know. But, you know, and that's why you're sitting here, I think, in large measure. How do we deal with that stuff now? Fake news. Also, in science. Some people say that, in fact, that's also a thing to think about, that the quality of Wikipedia, Wikipedia gets criticized, right? There's also things that are not always true on Wikipedia. But overall, the quality of Wikipedia is at least as good as the body of scientific literature. So, errors and wrong assumptions are happening at a daily basis. So how do you deal with that? So, um, so how do we deal with the, with the tsunami of information? How do we treat our data, by the way? I'll show you a slide in a moment. And how accessible is scientific data? 
how easy it is to um, get to the data that is measured about a certain individual in the US. Very modern country. They put stuff on computer disks. How accessible is it? Are we there? Can we just say a rare disease? We need to pull the patient data. Press a button. It's not there. So it shouldn't be there. Maybe. So here we go. Small story to run past. Stephen Keaton, brilliant student at MIT. He was very interested in, um, in, in um, uh, what is it again, neurobiology and so on. And he fabricated 3D printers all by himself. So this guy was interested in technology. He was very young. And then, you know, there's a long slide you can read, but I'll tell you the story. We'll go back to that in a moment. So this guy was brilliant and uh, was um, a brain, new brain scan technology was being developed at MIT. He was in that field and he said, oh, that's very nice. Can I, can I just join, you know, I want to see how my brain looks. So a couple of people did it just for the sake of science and an interest. And then they told him, look, ah, Steve, yeah, no, we see a little spot in your hoop, a little spot in your brain. Yeah, you know. Nothing to really worry about. It normally goes away anyway. It's not in any dangerous zone. So don't think about it. You'll be fine. That's what he thought. Then a few years later, he developed on a daily basis, two or three minutes, a very strong sense of vinegar smell. So he knew who's using vinegar. I hate the stuff, right? So he asked around. He said, oh, no, he smells anything. Oh, hey, every day it comes out. That's very strange. And then the guy was brilliant, I told you. He thought, ah, by the way, that spot they told me about is sort of, I think, in the area that is the smell center of my brain. So he panicked, of course. <laughs> and he went back to this, this guy from Belgium. He said, do it again, do it again. You know, oh, no, I'm, I'm scared. And he said, oh, no, no, no. You know, you, you, how old are you? Go away. You know, this never happens with this. So he went on and talked on, and persuaded people, went to the clinic. Then they did another scan, and they found a tumor in his head that has the size of this picture here, because this guy has printed his own tumor by the 3D printer he had fabricated himself and gave it as a nice Christmas present to the wider family. I don't know, you know, if that is very nice, but anyway, that's what he did. Okay, so, there you go. So, and then he decided, I can't work, I'm ill, I love data, I love neuro, I want to find out what bloody hell, you know, is the cause of this cancer being in the brain of a young guy like myself. I use all the energy I have to find this out. Give me my data. And that is where it stopped. They said, no, 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 no. Data privacy. We cannot reveal the identity of this data to you, sir. This is my data. Uh, sorry, we cannot reveal the identity of the data to you, sir. And, and, and so, uh, so it happened. This is the story you can read. So he, here he's about, ah, and this is, he had an uh, open brain surgery of 10 hours to get the three of you know, out, scary stuff, because they needed, it was in a center that was not easy, operable, so they had to look at all the reflexes. Anyway, this guy went through a bit of things, but then he had a few questions, you know, he said, I, I, I can't even get my data, everybody's just blocking me to get it, to find out the thing, how can it be that, you know, intelligent citizens are just blocked and impeded and sabotaged at, at what they want to accomplish, there is something like citizen science, people say. Why don't you allow clever people to think along the scientists? Why do you block it? You block even the scientists. So what is it? What's happening with data? Why is there not a hospital share button? Why are not patients the boss of their own data? Why do hospitals say, look, your data, we decide, it's ours. No, it's my DNA, bloody hell, you know. Okay. So we need a click button for every citizen where you say data can be open, data should be anonymized, you know, people should be the champions of their own data. So we should work through towards an infrastructure that supports those notions, right? And here is what he asked those questions. This, I'm telling this story because this was in all the major newspapers in, in the US. So this story has, has flown, and people, even hospitals, said, ooh, yeah, Steve, you have to do something about it. That's a while ago, now we see again that this, don't move, you know, dug it a bit, you know, it's not like past, and we can do what we want. Right? We are want to be the boss of our data. Because we, they tell us data valuable, so we, we're not going to give this away, right? So it's a whole total misconception of the power of internet, of the power of sharing, and so on. But still it happens. Yeah? These clever bioinformaticians will take the data and analyze it much faster than, than we can do in our lab. So we measure all this stuff, and then these guys, smart asses, take all the honor. We just wait. So, not good, but it happens. Okay, so another little story then. There is something else with data. People treat it badly. 
And people, we, I just sort of started alluding to you that data tends to grow a lot, even exponentially. But here is a paper that was a few years ago in Nature on what happens with the data that supports the papers, which is put on, which should, is published with the article. It's called supplementary data. It's the tables and the stuff. Why are you saying what you say? Check the figure in the supplementary data. So is that important data? You bet. Should it be there with the article? You bet. What happens the first year? Here's a slide where you see that after 10, 5 years already, the quarter is gone. And after 20 years, you know, nearly everything is gone. Of the, at least there was a study on the supplementary data. Data is not only growing, it's evaporating. Data evaporates. It goes away. Up. Smoke or whatever happens. So that's not good. And typically, people then say, well, where is the data set? Yeah, that's uh, oh, on the laptop of uh, the PhD student, you know. He left. Where is he? Yeah, somewhere in China. He didn't say where he was. Ah, okay, that's very good. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that's really what we try to get away with. Not good enough. So here you have that growth again. So data grows exponentially. Here you've got next generation sequencing data. You might know about Moore's law. You know about it. Compute power doubles every 18 months. You can calculate twice as fast. You can store twice as many data on the collective data storage devices the planet knows. Uh, but nowadays, and this is not... This is, this is even speeding up, you know, the doubling time is even getting shorter. It's six months at the moment, five months. How can we store the data physically? Even if we say, you know what, from next year or so, Facebook, forget it. We need to, this disk to store genomics data. Do you like it? Of course, the world will say, yes, let's do this. Fantastic idea. We're off Facebook anyway. Let's put only genomics data. We'll lose. Can't be done physically. So what problems do we, what can we do? Compress, that's a good technical term. Right? Compress the data, make it, uh, store it more efficiently. Ah, okay, you can only do so much. Then it's not a great idea. Uh, a lot of the measurements are just a lot of data to, to in the end, out of a genomic experiment comes a boring sequence. Letters, 3 billion letters for a human. That's not so much data, 3 gig or so. That's not much. But the experimental data is roughly 100, 100 uh, so terabytes or 100 terabytes, approaching sometimes petabytes. So, and then people say, you know what? We throw that away. If compression is we just throw it away. And you know what? Then when there is some issue of strange letters here in the DNA. Okay, let's measure it again. Let's look at the data. Ah, the data's not there anymore. What do we ah, let's measure it again. And then, hey, but what do we need to measure it again? A DNA molecule, at least one. Ah, what are those? So now you see that, that uh, biobanking, that's the phrase for it, so the bridges are bothered, right? So, you know, because of this requirement, you see now that biobanking is more fashionable than ever before. So, bridges in places, hospitals everywhere, all IT systems, we need this little thing of this patient. The robot goes into the room, five hours later it comes back, sweaty at all. Here it is. You know. <laughs> and even it has to do with bridges, so if you sweat then, a lot of work. Um, so that, that's what's happening. So you see the world, you know, one problem leads to another solution, leads to another problem, leads to, you know, that's, that's all science. Anyway, how important it is to deal with this data in a proper way. Here you go. Also in a paper a while ago, basically this is about reproducibility, having data, being able to redo experiments to check how the dependencies are. You need well-measured situations. And basically you might say that at least a quarter of all cost in the biomedical domain, and we talk billions and billions here, this is the US uh, statistics, uh, is lost due to bad treatment of the data. Oops, it was on the laptop of a guy who left. Right? Oh, this Excel sheet is not compatible with the next version, and it's all in Excel, yeah, but it doesn't hold the data anymore. The, 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 you know, Excel is not made for this. Anyway, we use it. Okay, so those kinds of things. <coughs> right, so... Um, with all this trouble, where are we heading? We're still we're heading towards the answering the big question, right? We, we talk about personalized healthcare, meaning the individual identity, such as reflected by a DNA molecule, is used for research. What is the best drug ever produced, according to Big Pharma, you think? Who has a name? You have it all, you've eaten it all. It's very cheap. It's called aspirin. Have you heard of aspirin? Who has not taken an aspirin so far? See? There you go. And that's my case. Everybody, including me. And uh, so what is Bayer? They were the inventors of that. They said, that's the greatest thing, you know. It did cost a lot. It was sort of, you know, we have once found it. We stumbled across. 
it was cheap in development cost and everybody absolutely eats it. Beautiful, that's what we want. We call that a blockbuster drug. And now we're telling with all of this personal, as you know, big pharma, we have all these people, you know. We now work out on a medicine for every condition, a different one, because every person needs a different treatment. So you go to a buyer, they say, well, there's the door. No, here's the wall. You know, I kick you through the wall. Go away. You know. We need blockbuster drugs. So what do we do? I'll get back on that. So, so here is a bit of thing. So we do a lot with big data. And then, you know, uh, the stories are told, and you see some hypes here, because these medicines, this is for cystic fibrosis. I'll, I'll show you the disease at the end of this lecture, I think. And there is receptin that was claimed as one of the big successes, the first rational drugs, protein structures made for breast cancer, uh, hormone-receptive breast cancers, so very important medication. And they said there's big data, and they look, no, with in fact, it was more than knowledge by molecular biologists who knew these structures, and were looking and turning and looking again and asking colleagues more than just, you know, all of this gratuitous loading of data looking at it. So, there is hype there, but still, you know, there's a big place to be taken by machines, sequencing machines like that, the personalized medicine, but we always have to think, and you've maybe seen this curve, it's also like sort of an exponential curve within the other way. There are a few dominant courses, uh, causes of disease, sorry, causes there. But then you see that, you know, there is one disease and then, oh, but it could also be this. It could also be this. Oh, there is one in a hundred patients that have this gene up. Oh, and there is even sometimes, oh, then it's very bad if you have that because then the, the symptoms are worse than, than with the dominant case. So how do you treat a disease? And I'll show you one CF in a moment where this is really an issue. It's all simple, but then... Okay, but still the idea of personalized medicine, and then we're going to drink a cup of coffee, I guess, is, uh, you know, this is healthy here. Here's where people are, healthy people are. And then here is sort of the, uh, the, the risk, the danger zone. This is, you know, where you, you, you might, you, you're up in the, in the, in the chances to, to attract some disease, let's say, bad or like cancer. And here is when the disease phase clicks in. So in the old days, you went to a doctor, and then you would tell the doctor, like, oh, I think something is coming up in me. Go home. I'm here to treat people who are sick. You're healthy. You're not fine falling down in front of my eyes. You know, you're okay. As far as I'm concerned, go away. Anyway. And um, there are this, this, this Dutch joke, right? Or it's a joke made by foreigners about Dutch GPs in healthcare. So you are there in this country and, you know, people are nice to you. But you, you get a very bad stomach ache. So, you, so you, you barely make it to your GP. You say, what, what's that? Ah, I think there's something here. So we look, the guy looks at you and he says, ah, nah, mm. you know what, go home. We watch it for two weeks and then come back. <laughs> so you know, two weeks. Ah, I'm already getting worried. Ah, it's only engine. I'll get to the GP after two weeks. You're there. And then the guy says, ooh, you were here before, eh? <laughs> I think, yeah, now it's so bad, you should look at least another three weeks at this, right? So, ah, <laughs> that's it. So, yeah. so, you know, and then there is uh, two ways. Things problems go away. In two ways, you might get, okay, again, or you just died, and the problem is over too, so I think the system is sort of, anyway, so foreigners take some issue there, but, uh, you know, that's how we do things. Now, come on, you know, we talk nicely to you, and then let it, let it go for another piece. So, the idea here is, no, 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 that's not so good. Even if you're here, we know, and we try to, to, to put you back into the health zone, so to speak. And then here, we know so much that you can quickly, but again, Personal drugs, a problem. So what can we do? Combination therapy, perhaps. Making combi eat an aspirin and something else, and something else in certain dosage. What about an orange every day? You know what, you eat three oranges. That's because the GP tells you. Vitamins, nutrition, lifestyle. You go, we know for breast cancer, for example, that exercise is tremendously important. Go to, I, I had it. One of my best friends died a couple of years ago. We were at the best specialist of kidney cancer. And I asked, what kind of daily regime would you, would you suggest here, this guy? Because he was training like a madman. But also I had told him, do it. It's good for you. You know, you fight it. You, it's good for you. And this guy said, I don't care. I'm here to treat people who are ill. Come on. Don't talk to me about lifestyle. I'm a doctor. So, there you go. So we need to change the culture here. Now. And that is what we... What is going to happen? Um, uh, what will happen? So, connecting a lot, bit of stuff, you know, wearables, people wear blood pressure, 
You have loads of stuff. In the end, there will be chips in your arm and so on, not only when you're a member of a certain nightclub or anything, but you have a whole battery of stuff. You might move, you know, next day, we'll walk like this. Because there's metal everywhere. Forget piercing, you know. We do a whole different story. And, and uh, I don't know, but you know, a lot of data will be produced at a daily basis 24 7 by people. This is all the ideas, we can start doing this. But how do we organize it? How do we treat all the data? So, another thing is here. There are a few categories of drugs, you know. Most drugs are uh, here. They're very toxic and they're not beneficial. We think they're beneficial, but if you look carefully, it hardly helps. The belief that it helps is the main, the main functionality. So here is what you want. You want a drug that is not toxic and that is beneficial. But then you need to take into consideration personal knowledge to be able to decide that. It turns out that Developing a drug for, for the Western world, typically, of course, white gentlemen by the age of 42, that's where we develop the drugs for. Then you go to a country like Japan, and at once it doesn't work, even if you give it to a guy 42 years old, because of personal differences. So we need to take that into account. And the idea, of course, like medicine is you're able to stratify populations, you are like that patient, not because you say, ah, I feel roughly the same. No, because we know from the genetic makeup that you're, you know, you're bound to fall in the same category, and that means we can pull people and research them as groups. So all of that is really important, and it all hangs on and is dependent on, on, on sequencing. One slide to send you into coffee, the last one. It's one of my favorite little researchers a few years ago. This is DNA sequence, well, zeros and ones. The two positions is a letter then here, right? A, C, T, or G, as you know by now. Um, so what did they do here? They say that it was about HIV research. HIV is a virus, human immunodeficiency virus, right? What do viruses do? They're clever little bastards because they are able to penetrate, to build themselves into your genome and all of your genetical system is working and proteins are being formed and the things are being read and this virus in fact says, no, 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 you know, we, use, we jump on the back of a bicycle, which we do a lot in this country at least, right? And we drive along with you, you don't even notice. And so light. Right? And um, so one of the things is how we treat genetic diseases so far, with gene therapy, people saying, ah, the virus is fooling us. It's not fooling the virus. We build a little bit of DNA into the viral DNA, and that's something that we want, something good. And then that virus 